diligence, used 15 times in 14 verses of the Bible. Diligence is making it well with my soul and mind so that it brings righteous joy and gladness to my being. The importance of the covenant of marriage as defined by Jesus Christ. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemmer. And I'm Janice. You are tuned to Quick Study Television, Quick Study Radio. Thank you for watching and listening today. And on this program, as we go through the Bible in one year, we're focused on Mark chapter 10 through 12. Now here it is where Jesus Christ himself speaks with the authority of God on marriage because he is God. Now it's going to be an interesting day as we study the marriage covenant, the bereft of marriage. And so stay with us for that. Ryan is here with Cosmic Mysteries, right? Today we continue with our study of the coming four blood moons. Stick around. All right, Corey is also here with Bible Archaeology and History, Corey. Today we're looking at a place that Jesus spent a surprising amount of time. We're going to take a look at the Mount of Olives. And Janice Hembry is here with Do You Know? Do you know which of Jesus' disciples wanted to sit one on his right hand and one on his left? Oh, it's a power play. A mm -hmm. power play is in play. That and more coming up. Stay there. It's a good one. Quick Study continues. Now covered in our reading today in the Gospel of Mark is what is referred to as the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Now he starts this journey from uh, the Mount of Olives and he, he goes down the mountain and then up into Jerusalem via the East Gate. Right now you and I are going to take a look at the history and some of the prophecies around the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is a mountain ridge just east of the city of Jerusalem. As an important protective feature and lookout point for the capital city of Israel, the Mount of Olives has appeared in several important moments recorded within the Bible. The first mention is with no surprise connected to the king who founded Jerusalem, King David. It is a mournful account from 2 Samuel 15. David's son had launched a rebellion. And to save his life, King David walked out of Jerusalem with his court, weeping and lamenting as he climbed the Mount of Olives to lead the city. It is interesting to note here that the claimed Messiah of the New Testament, Jesus, a descendant of King David, entered Jerusalem before the Passover, coming back from the way David exited. Jesus rode on a donkey as prophesied in Zechariah 9, down the Mount of Olives and into Jerusalem, while people shouted praises from Psalm 118. During this last Passover of Jesus' life, the New Testament documents that Jesus would spend his days teaching in the temple complex and his nights outside of the city on the Mount of Olives. When paired with a prophecy from the Old Testament book of Ezekiel, this detail becomes intriguing. In Ezekiel 11, verse 22 and 23, the glory of God is seen to leave the temple complex and rest on the Mount of Olives. The New Testament also details Jesus' teaching on the future that he gave on the Mount of Olives, and it names the Mount of Olives as the place of Jesus' ascension into heaven. According to the Old Testament prophet Zechariah, in the last days, God will descend upon the Mount of Olives and use it in a very intriguing way.
It is time to look at the wise guys of the Bible and they are all around us. Today our reading of Mark chapter 10 to 12 takes us here. Jesus Messiah was not born into a religious or social vacuum. The Roman Empire was rife with adultery, pedophilia, sexual abuse, and much of it was sanctified by Roman authorities. The Jewish creed was different than the Roman regions and religions. Still, wise guys recognize that power cultures infect the community of Christ, if we're not careful. It was natural for the Pharisees and the scribe to ask Jesus about divorce and family and for Jesus Messiah to teach on family and children. Wise guys also notice in Mark 10 that Jesus points back to Genesis for family authority to connect our wayward thinking of today. Mark 10, 1 through 16. Then he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan. And multitudes gathered to him again, and as he was accustomed, he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. In the house, his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. So he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Then they brought the little children to him, that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. Rod Hembry here. This is Quick Study Television, Quick Study Radio. Thank you for joining us. And as we go through the New Testament, we learn two things. Number one, Jesus is not politically correct. And number two, Jesus is not for Christian culture. Jesus is for the kingdom of God, which is far beyond what we would call Christian culture. Now then, having said that, we go to Mark, and I want to talk to you about marriage. Now, I know there's a lot of the, we're, we live in an authority crisis, and in today's world, everything in authority is being challenged. The authority of government, the authority of stability, the authority of law, the authority of the church, the authority of God's word, and the authority of marriage. It's all being challenged. With that, I want to direct my comments to those who call themselves believers in Jesus Christ. I'm directing my comments to you for a reason. In Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 9, we see that Jesus is confronted with something. It says, Then he arose from there, and he came into the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan. And multitudes gathered to him. And again, they gathered to him again, and he was accustomed, as his was his custom, he taught them again. But then verse 2 tells us, The Pharisees then came and asked him. Now listen to their question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now notice they did this to test him. They were testing Jesus. They did not care about the divorced. They did not care about the wife. They did not care about the husband. They had no care about the family, but they wanted to test him. 
And Jesus answered and he said to them, what did Moses command you? And they said, well, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus replied and said to them, it is because of the hardness of your heart that he wrote this precept. But from the beginning, that's Genesis, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And for this reason only, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. And the two, look at this line, shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two. Look what he says. Jesus said it twice. They're no longer two, but they are one flesh. Therefore, verse 9, what God has joined together, let not man separate. <sighs> Take a deep breath. Get your oxygen ready. Here's the truth. Jesus teaches that marriage is the only reason to break up a family. Divorce is a result of hardness of heart. I did not say to you that Jesus rejected you because you were divorced. I did not say to you that Jesus curses you because you were divorced. I'm telling you that somewhere along the line there is hardness of heart that could not be penetrated by the redemptive power of Jesus Christ because of a willful decision and the end was a broken relationship. That's what Jesus taught. Now let's get on to this because I want to talk more about this. In verse 10 it says, in the house of his disciples, also they asked him again about the same matter because they were, they were traumatized by this. Verse 11, so he said to him, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Beloved, the hardcore reality is that Jesus teaches that marriage is so sacred that it cannot be undone with lawyers or passions. Marriage is a godly covenant. In fact, the word is bereth. The first time it's used is in Genesis chapter 6. I believe it's verse 12. And God says to Noah, he says, Noah, I'm going to make a bereth with you, a covenant with you. And I'm going to make an alliance. The word covenant means alliance. An alliance against evil. And God used the family of Noah to demonstrate an alliance against evil. And on this side of the fallen creation, God teaches us prior to fallen creation, God had made man and woman and God presided over the first marriage. All authority for marriage comes from the word of God, not from the nations, not from the states, not from the provinces, not from any institution of man. Marriage and its authority and the blessing of God comes directly from the Word of God and the obedience to it. Jesus teaches that marriage is sacred. I'm talking to the believers in Jesus Christ. All right, verse 13 says, Then they brought little children to him that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked him who brought them. But Jesus, when he saw it, was greatly displeased with his disciples. And he said to them, knock it off, guys. Let the little children to come to me. Do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms and laid his hands on them and blessed them. Wow. I mean, this is an intense... Ah, nobody does this. Rabbis don't do this. Pharisees don't do it. They let other people do it. They let the women do it. Jesus holds the children. Jesus teaches that children have a unique and special place in the arms of God the Father. Now, beloved, you may be ravaged with a betrayal of divorce at this moment. I want to pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, heal us. Heal us of the hardness of heart. You may be a child of divorce. And you have seen the covenant between your father and your mother dissolved in the hardness and the arguments, betrayal, or maybe adultery. But I'm telling you that God's plan works, that marriage works when God is the center, when it is a covenant marriage, and when the men and the women in the marriage decide to put God first and themselves second, then God has access to heal any offense 
And I pray for the marriages that are in trouble right now, Lord Jesus, who are watching this program. I pray that there would be a softening of heart in both the wife and the husband that would bring the repentance of God in such a way as to restore the marriage, to return to intimacy and truth, and to make that marriage be uplifted in the name of Jesus Christ. The teaching material on today's program is in print form in our Bible guide. Write for yours today. The address is coming up later. Now, there are a few times in the Gospels where the religious leaders of the day try to trap Jesus by getting him to say something negative against the emperor, against Caesar. And of course, this doesn't work. Jesus handles himself beautifully. But right now, what I want to look at is who was that Caesar ruling during the days of Jesus? As Princep, chief citizen of the Empire of Rome, Caesar Augustus had manipulated the lives of those close to him. Unfortunately for Rome, people change more than laws when they are moved or bent. Augustus needed an heir. He married his young daughter Julia first to his nephew, who died shortly after, and then to one of his army commanders, whom Julia had two sons with. But this second husband died also. So Augustus turned to his stepson Tiberius and required him to divorce his current wife to marry Julia. This did not work. Julia's two sons died, and Julia herself became so promiscuous that Augustus banished her to a penile colony. Tiberius had become the default heir. Tiberius took full control when he was 55 years old, and he took a different approach to governing Rome. He retreated away from the city and endowed more power to the commander of the Praetorian Guard, personal army of the Princep, Sejanus. Reports of Tiberius's time away from Rome are disturbing. It seems he denied himself nothing that he wanted, setting up for himself debased fantasies on his own private island. His peace was soon threatened by the very man he had entrusted with power, Sejanus. Sejanus had positioned himself to take over after Tiberius, and there was a nasty rumor that he was responsible for the death of Tiberius's own son. Tiberius came back to Rome. He began a reign of terror, a great purge of anyone even distantly connected to Sejanus torture and execution became the new law. The empire was walking on eggshells, trying to stay off of Tiberius's bloody radar. This included the governor of Judea that Judanus had appointed. His name was Pontius Pilate. The most dangerous threat to the world today is the casual Christian. Join Rod Hembry on his latest video working directly from the scriptures to discover the truth about our present times and the spiritual warfare in it. Discover why the present day church in the West is weak and how to change it. This DVD also comes with a second provocative presentation titled, Who is Satan? Discover the real enemy in this world behind the wars, crime, sickness, disease, death, and starvation. Both presentations, The Dangerous Casual Christian and Who is Satan, are expository teaching directly from the scripture. And for a suggested donation of $25 or more, we will send it to you. Write today and receive your DVD. Write to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. It's time for Cosmic Mysteries, Ryan. 
Today we conclude our coming Four Blood Moon series. We've spent the last three Fridays exploring different interpretations of the data, and today we conclude with a final review and conclusion. There are going to be four lunar eclipses or blood moons with a solar eclipse in the middle between the dates of April 2014 and October 2015. While some believe that these coming eclipses are the signs mentioned in the prophecy of Joel in the Bible, others believe that they are not. While critics admit that these four eclipses in a row, called the Tetrad, are rare, they do not believe that they are unique. Let us examine the passage of scripture which some believe are describing these blood moons. Joel chapter 2 verses 30 and 31 says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Proponents of the blood moon view not only point to the future dates of these blood moons, but also to the past occurrences. This tetrad with a solar eclipse in the middle has happened three times in the past that we know of. Once in 1492, again in 1948, and a final time in 1967. Interestingly, on each of these dates, some significant Jewish event took place. 1492 was the Edict of Expulsion, 1948 was the year Israel was reborn after the Holocaust, and 1967 was the Six-Day War when Israel was attacked by six Arab nations. Miraculously, Israel was victorious and the city of Jerusalem reunited with Israel for the first time in 2,000 years. Subscribers of this view expect some big Jewish-centered event to happen again with the coming eclipses in 2014 and 2015. Critics of the blood moons point to several scientific arguments. First, not all lunar eclipses are red. Based on the atmospheric conditions at the time of the eclipse, a wide range of colors and brightnesses can occur. Because of this fact, critics believe it is a bit presumptuous to assume that any particular future eclipse, or in this case four eclipses, must of necessity be blood moons. Second, they demonstrate that total lunar eclipses are not that unusual. In the 21st century alone, there will be 85 total lunar eclipses. It was also demonstrated that because Passover and Sukkot always happen at full moon, which is the only time a lunar eclipse can occur, it is not that amazing that an eclipse will sometimes occur. Critics of the blood moons also ask us to consider the 37 lunar eclipses of the 20th century, which coincided with either Passover or Sukkot. They explain the solar eclipse in like manner. The third thing they point out is that some of the eclipses will only be visible from obscure places and therefore question whether these coming blood moons will be much of a sign at all. While the scientific observations are interesting, there is still something that remains unanswered. Critics did not respond to the fact that at each of the past occurrences of these eclipses, some big Jewish-centered event occurred. Although only time will tell whether or not these upcoming eclipses are those particular signs mentioned in the Bible, we can be sure of one thing. These events will occur. Though man has interpreted the scriptures wrongly many times, the Bible, with not one failed prophecy, remains true. Now I just want to say that it's very important that we don't criticize subscribers of either of these views. I respect everyone involved here and I think that both sides make some excellent observations. Truthfully though, only time will tell. And what you choose to believe is up to you. But what I want you to take from all of this is that we as believers in Jesus Christ must remember to always be ready. Because Jesus could come back at any moment. And to those who haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I ask you to consider Him. He will change your life in a very real and exciting way. And you will also secure your eternity with Him. And we do want to mention to you, thank you, Ryan, for these mm -hmm. great reports, uh, that we know both of these individuals, of course, John Hagee, who has made the blood moon uh, popular, and of course, uh, Danny Faulkner, who is a good friend of ours too. So if oftentimes we find ourselves presenting both sides for the purpose of your decision. On Monday, we're going to be talking about the fisherman's call, ladies and gentlemen. We're reading Luke chapter 4 to 6, so don't miss a day here on Quick Study. Over the weekend is only on BibleDiscoveryTV.com, so you want to, you want to go to www.BibleDiscoveryTV.com and watch our weekend edition program. We also have Do You Know? Yes, we do. So, do you know which of Jesus' disciples wanted to sit one on his right hand and one on his left? I love the disciples. They are just like me, so like human. Like you and I, that's so right. So human, mm -hmm. it is awesome. Okay, Corey, do you know who this is? <laughs> I think so. It's James and John, right? The sons of Zebedee? You're absolutely right. Yes. The sons of Thunder, the too. The sons of Thunder, that's right. Now, do you know whose suggestion this was, mm. actually? Mm, yeah. Who's? It was a power play by their mother. 
That's and right. Her mom. mom. That's right. If you look back at Matthew chapter 20, verses 20 and 21, you will see that she actually suggests this and is present um, in the Gospel of Matthew uh, while the, the, these men are asking Jesus. I love the role of moms in the Bible. Of course, uh, the, the mother of Christ in the marriage or the wedding, the first miracle of mm -hmm. Jesus, water into wine. Amazing. It's Look at moms in the Bible. You'll find it interesting. Let's carry on. The Bible teaches that marriage is a covenant powered by God's authority, not defined by the governments of man. The authority to define marriage comes exclusively from the book of Genesis when God made man and woman for each other. The word covenant also means alliance. So marriage was God's plan to keep evil from the earth. Since the fall of man, evil has attempted to destroy the covenant of marriage. God's wisdom is at work in us when we learn that marriage is not defined by the governments of men, but by the Word of God. God uses marriage to illustrate His covenant with His church, who is called the Bride of Christ. With that, we pray, Lord, teach me to honor You in my marriage by being faithful to it. In our Wise Up segment today, we continue to study Proverbs. Now, today we are looking at Proverbs chapter 21, verse 3. Here is what the Bible says. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. As a matter of fact, there's other places in the Bible where it says to do righteousness and justice is the acceptable sacrifice of the Lord. The question is, what is righteousness? I mean, how can anybody be righteous, really? Is anybody perfect, really? Only one, Jesus Christ. Now, the word righteousness means right with God. All of us are sinners. I'm a sinner, saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. What in the world does that mean? It means that I recognize that it was Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, who came, born of the Virgin, died on the cross, and rose again to give me the provision to, to, to deal with my sin covered in his blood and, and to take the gift of eternal life that he gave me when he rose again overcoming death. That's how I become righteous, by coming to Christ and saying, Jesus, I need you. Come to Christ today. Thank you for joining us today on Quick Study. We are supported by viewers and listeners like you. Remember, on radio, our address is P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also reach us at BibleDiscoveryTV.com.